so I've been asked to say something about teachers as stakeholders. Do they have a voice? Do they have choice in terms of autonomy? Do they have incentives for good performance? <coughs> so I'm going to take each of these in turn. Do teachers have a voice? Are their views and concerns heard? Are they taken into account in education policy making? And it seems to me that the answer is a resounding yes in the following sense. Firstly, research shows that no state government of India has the courage to ignore teacher voice. Teachers have a powerful position. They are in a politically advantageous position uh, because they have a privileged uh, uh, sort of status in the Constitution of India, which guarantees that uh, teachers shall have their own separate constituency from which they will elect members to the upper houses of the state legislature. One twelfth of the membership of the upper house has to be made up of persons who are elected from the teacher constituency. So that has led to a culture of political activism <coughs> and actual uh, presence of teachers in the uh, in the legislature. May I just uh, let's just see if I can get that. So if you look at the last column, teachers as a percentage of the total membership of the upper house of the Uttar Pradesh legislature from 1952 to 2008. If you look at the very last row, you see that about 17% of all uh, the total membership of the upper house has been made up of persons whose occupation is teaching. It's not only in the upper house, it's also in the lower house where there is no ga uh, constitutionally guaranteed representation. Here, people are elected from a general constituency, not from a teacher constituency. Nevertheless, we see that if we were to take the average, and I have not sh updated this table here, but I have it with me. <coughs> Unfortunately, I put an older slide. But basically, it turns out that about 6.6%, nearly just under 7% of the membership of the lower house of Uttar Pradesh legislature over this 50, 60 odd year period has been made up of teachers. So we see that teachers have a strong presence in the legislature, uh, obviously way higher than their represent you know their, their proportion in the population in the adult population then teachers all I mean we know that teachers man polling booths at election time so that gives them this very you know strong you know perceived position uh, in, in the eyes of the uh, the the, the, the uh, politicians they do not want to upset the teachers because they could stuff the ballot boxes uh, now it's even easier with those machines um, then you know, the uh, teacher unions are very strong forces. Uh, we know that because if you look at, uh, you know, important pieces of educational legislation, and my study has been mostly for Uttar Pradesh, so I can speak about that uh, as an illustrative example, but uh, presumably the situ situation is not hugely dissimilar in other states. So if you look at that, what you find is that important pieces of educational legislation in Uttar Pradesh or important government rules in the education sector have come about immediately after periods of strong teacher lobbying. So education policy making has been reactive to teacher voice. Um, so they are well placed because of all of these uh, range of uh, factors that I've just mentioned, they're well placed to make their voices heard. Now as to whether, you know, what are the issues on which they have raised their voices, that is a, another question altogether. The fact that they have voice means that it is potentially a very wonderful po potential positive force that is available uh, if they choose to exercise their voice for a range of issues that might benefit the education sector. But do they? The question is, uh, you know, I don't think that there's a great deal of research on it, but in, in, a, in a book that I wrote with my co-author Mohammed Mazamil in 2003, which is published by the Oxford University Press, called The Political Economy of Education in India, Teacher Politics in Uttar Pradesh. In that, uh, we look at the period from 1965 to about 2002, and we look at, we, we document each of the major teacher uh, ac action periods in every, in each of the given years. Uh, mostly, there was some major activity in most of the years, individual years. And what were the issues on which teachers were lobbying the government during those episodes? And uh, what we found is that teachers have lobbied almost exclusively, in fact, overwhelmingly, uh, rarely was there anything other than to do with their salaries and their service conditions. It could be leave, it could be triple housing benefit, it could be PF, it could be city compensatory allowance, house rent allowance, it could be EPF, it could be any number of things. It could be DA, pensions, etc., etc. Those were the issues on which they, they have uh, overwhelmingly lobbied. Now, the report of the National Commission on Teachers, which sat from 1984 to 1986, uh, and which was published in 1986, 
uh, also noted something similar. It said uh, that the main quote, the main preoccupation of teachers' organizations, particularly since independence, has been with the improvement of salary and service conditions of teachers. And in this, they have achieved considerable success. So now the veracity of these points can be checked in a number of ways. One good way, good way is to look at the evolution of teacher salaries. You know, if, teacher vo if it is indeed the case, as the, the National Commission on Teachers said, and as my research shows, my research is for Uttar Pradesh, NCT was for the country as a whole. For two years, they investigated by interviewing thousands of educational stakeholders up and down the country, and they came up with that conclusion. But you can check that by looking at what has actually happened to teacher salary? Now, I have a whole separate paper on that. It would take one hour to go through that. But you know, in a nutshell, basically, uh, one point that can be shared is here uh, quickly is that the, the proportion of salary expenditure in total recurrent education expenditure, that has changed very much uh, over time. And non-salary expenditure has been squeezed out. Uh, so, for example, in 1961, 12% of um, total recurrent uh, education expenditure at the elementary education level was on non-salary uh, items. By 1999, it had fallen to 1%. Um, of course, under SSA, it has gone up a little bit. It could be close to 4 or 5% now. But even so, more than 95% of education expenditure in elementary education is still going on teacher salaries. Um, today in Uttar Pradesh, and one can do this calculation for other states as well, and I have done it, but I'm citing the case for Uttar Pradesh. I can also cite it for Bihar. The ratio of teacher salary to per capita state GDP is of the order of 15 to 20, depending on whether we're talking about Uttar Pradesh or Bihar. Um, so one can see that they have been spectacularly, the teachers have been spectacularly successful in, uh, in arranging, you know, in, in, in exercising their voice to obtain a good salary position, particularly good in the sense of in relation to per capita GDP of the state. 15 to 20 times means something uh, also. There's a paper by Matthew in the Economic and Political Weekly in 1990 in which he says, in which he reflects on why it is uh, that, uh, that this is the state of affairs with respect to the allocation of expenditure in this way. He says, quote, while militantly organized teachers exert strong pressure on the state government to increase their salaries, no lobby or pressure group exists to demand government grants for non-salary school expenses. So they have exercised their voice, but uh, usually in, in, in the direction of improving the benefits for themselves. The National Commission on Teachers thought that perhaps they had, perhaps they had too much voice, which needed moderating by parents. And I'll quote from that. They did not use the term too much voice, but the, what they said, it seems to me, amounts to something close to that. They said on page 71 in their report, 1986, quote, we must draw attention to the need to promote actively parents' organizations all over the country. We feel that such organizations are desperately needed to promote and safeguard the educational interests of their wards and to counteract the negative and unhealthy political preoccupations of some of the teachers and their organizations. So saying that the only way in which we can rein in, um, you know, some of the teachers, uh, the, the, the negative and unhealthy political preoccupations of some of the teachers and their organizations is by having parent voice. Come on, I don't know what, what, what Rukmini has to say on parent voice in relation uh, to this point. If voice is exercised for both teachers' own interest and also for the children's interest, then it can really lead to good. But at present, the indications seem to be that where voice is exercised, in fact, outcomes are worse. Um, so if we just look at this uh, table, so these are, this is just two slides from my uh, paper about the episodes, the teacher union uh, uh, episodes. Um, I'll go straight to this table. So basically, I've collected data uh, from 186 schools affiliated to the ICSE Examination Board. This is data on class 10 students. I had data on, on these schools from across 16 major states of India. And this is an achievement production function, basically which shows what are the determinants of student achievement. And, uh, you know, at the, in the bottom panel, you can see that we controlled for a whole range of things, for example, pupil uh, characteristics and school characteristics. And then we've controlled for teacher characteristics. And those are the ones, those are the results that I'm actually showing. And controlling for a whole range of 
different types of teacher characteristics, we see the variable of most interest for our purposes today is the one that's at the top, whether the teacher is a member of a union. And because we had students' data on five different subjects, and we had the, the, the characteristics of the teachers of those five different subjects. Therefore, this is the last column shows what is known as the pupil fixed effects estimation. That means the estimation is within a pupil, so across the subjects. Is it the case that a student's achievement is uh, greater or lesser in a subject that is taught by a teacher who is a union member than in a subject that is taught by a teacher who is not a union member? So it's a very stringent methodology for trying to get to the causal effect of being taught by a teacher who is a union member. And what we see, the headline figure is basically that if you're taught a sub in, in, in a subject that you're taught by a unionized teacher, your achievement is about a quarter of a standard deviation lower than your own achievement in a subject that is taught by a teacher who's not unionized, who's not a member of a union. Now this is um, school dance data, which actually my panel co-panelist here with me and I collected together in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. This is table. For, this is a table for Uttar Pradesh only. And here, uh, so I'm just showing the, the, the full table, but the next uh, page of the, it, this is a continuation of the same table. And you see that the governance variables at the bottom are the variables of most interest for today's purposes. And we see that if, if a child is taught by a union member, there's a lower achievement, it's statistically significantly lower. And if, uh, if the child is taught by a politically connected teacher, a, a, a teacher who says that she or he has either met or personally knows a teacher politician, then also the achievement level of the student is significantly lower than, the, than if the student is taught by a teacher who is not politically so connected. So why should it be that if you're taught by a teacher union member or a politically connected teacher, your learning level is going to be lower? Is it the case that being these things reduces teacher effort? We had several measures for teacher effort, and we requested each of these measures on these two um, uh, indicators of uh, political connections and teacher union membership. And we control for teacher characteristics. We do a school fixed effects estimator. It's not necessarily causal, but it is something that is a lot better than simple regression analysis because this is within school analysis. So we see that, for example, teacher absence rate is very significantly higher if, uh, 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 if the teacher uh, that means this, this measure of effort is very significantly lower if the teacher is politically connected, if a teacher personally knows a teacher MLC. And down the line, percentage of teachers' uh, school time given to teaching, percentage of teachers' school time given to organizing prayers and games. If you look down the line, basically you find that a lot of the teacher effort measures are lower if, a student, uh, if uh, the teacher is politically connected. Okay, so um, <coughs> moving on then. Uh, so, you know, forming a teacher union... Uh, uh, a worker union is a legitimate worker right in any democratic society and lobbying for higher salaries is a very legitimate purpose of a uh, teacher union. However, the political clout of teachers uh, has meant that it has been difficult by the gov for the government to deal with teacher demands. And so teacher voice has been exercised perhaps in a lopsided kind of a way. Um, going on to the second issue, can uh, increased teacher choice improve learning outcomes, increased autonomy for teacher. In principle, of course, <coughs> greater choice for a, a professional practitioner can really unleash their creativity and their ability to innovate and to do research and so forth. Uh, but my sense is, and I don't know whether my panelists will agree with me, and you will agree with me, my sense is that this has not been uh, a major issue in the discussions that I have heard and in when, when we have done the surveys, teachers have not said that this is a major issue for them, that they don't have the leeway uh, to adapt and innovate and uh, introduce uh, new methodologies if they want to. Uh, moreover, the exercise of choice is wise when teachers are well prepared, they're well equipped professionally, they have the appropriate professional skills and they have uh, uh, you know, they are well trained. The problem is that they are not adequately prepared. And the reason why we know that is because when we did competency tests in the school tell survey, which in fact, Rukmini had drafted those tests for teachers. And subsequently, uh, those uh, several <coughs> tests were done in, in a five state study uh, by UNICEF, which Rukmini was also involved in. That the problem is that competency levels are really uh, problematic. Um, so I'll just show that uh, briefly. Here is, you know, vocabulary related tasks. Do teachers know word meaning? So from the class three and four textbook, we took some of the words that occur that that are there in these class three and four textbooks, and we asked the teachers to write down their word meanings. 
32% of the teachers, 32% uh, of the word meanings that were written down were incorrect. And 43% were wholly correct. Now these were judged by, as judged by the senior teachers of the Bihar SCERT. Um, and then we asked them to summarize a piece of text, a hundred word story text, to summarize it in two sentences at most. And this is one of the examples. And 33% uh, of the teachers wrote summaries that were judged to be irrelevant or incorrect <laughs> summaries. So it seems that about one third of the teachers have difficulties with literacy skills. And then were there any spelling errors in their two sentence summary, which they wrote of that story text? No spelling errors, 40% of the teachers. That means 60% of the teachers had spelling errors in what they wrote. So, um, and then we gave a piece of text in which we had deliberately put mistakes. And we asked the teachers, this is, a child, this is what a child has written, please circle anywhere where you th think that there is a mistake, a spelling mistake or a grammar mistake. And we had deliberately put in six mis uh, mistakes or seven mistakes in, in one of them. We had three samples of the tests, of this, uh, tests of the same level of difficulty. And basically we found that 50% of the teachers found only three or fewer mistakes when there were in fact six or more mistakes, six or seven mistakes. So the ability to spot mistakes was also uh, problematic. Coming to numeracy skills, percentage problem, there are 38 children enrolled uh, in a class. Of these 23 children are present today, what percentage of children are absent today? This kind of a percentage question occurs in the grade four maths textbook in both Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. Um, and this is some of the ways in which and they were asked to show the workings as well. The teachers were asked to show the workings in doing this. So this is the kind of thing he said. So they have not been able to take out the percentages. So he's just shown uh, 55 minus 32 equals 23. Um, and you know, no, no, no reference is made to percentage. Uh, what, what we found overall is that 24.5, just under a quarter of the teachers could actually do the percentage sum. That means 75% of teachers could not. So whereas in literacy skills, 33% of teachers or maybe 40% of teachers were struggling. In this case, 75% of teachers are struggling in maths, basic maths. Area problem, it's found in the grade uh, five textbook of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. And in this task, 28% uh, of teachers could do the area uh, sum and 72% of teachers could not. Similarly, you know, these are three work, three children's, uh, three different children's workings of a, the same question, 927 divided by 9. And we asked the teachers which one of these workings is correct, give the correct answer. And 78% of teachers got it correct, but that means 22% of teachers did not know which of these is the correct answer. And for the uh, percentage, some these were some of the workings that they showed. And when we asked teachers, to what extent do you agree with the statement? Sometimes I have difficulties in addressing the mathematical queries and problems for my students. Uh, the, the percentage that disagreed was of the order of between 20 to 25 percent who disagreed. That means 75 percent or 80 percent of teachers are agreeing that they have difficulties in answering maths queries and problems. Then, so the problem is that you know, when you give people autonomy, it should be on the basis of some strength. Here we need to actually build that capacity before we can really say that you know why don't you go and innovate? I mean, it's good to innovate even with low capacity because there are other areas, not necessarily pedagogic areas, in which they can innovate. And that freedom should be there. But in this dimension at least, that there is a, a need to build strength. And the last um, uh, issue is can incentives for teachers improve their performance? There has been a doubling of teacher pay under the Six Pay Commission and it raised teacher pay across the board. It was not as if it was discerning as to which teachers are better performing and will reward them to a higher extent than others. And um, this, you know, if we look at, for example, the best, uh, the, the only source of data we have on student achievement levels in India is the SR survey. And I don't think between the period of 2009 when it came into force and 2011, three years later, I don't think that achievement levels have improved in India. So we doubled teacher pay and achievement levels have not changed. Yeah. Uh, so that in itself suggests that raising pay across the board is not a good way of giving, it's not a smart way of uh, putting your scarce resource into uh, improving teacher incentives. Many countries have moved to uh, some form or another of performance, performance related pay. As Ashish says, Karthik's work on in, in um, uh, South India shows uh, that there is uh, a substantial benefit from a very small economic incentive, you get quite a good increase in student achievement. 
both in the team incentive and in the individual incentive variants. And this is not just for India. You look at research for other countries, you also find this is the case. Although there is some ambiguity, for example, in the case of Kenya, um, Michael Kramer found that uh, uh, teachers began to teach to the test. But when you put that point to somebody like Eric Hanushek, he says, well, you know, if they're teaching through the test, what's so bad about that? The point is at least the test is designed to test whether the children have basic numeracy and literacy skills. If they're teaching basic numeracy and literacy skills so that the teachers, so that the children can perform in those, well, that's thoroughly good. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, you can read that how you like. But there can also be performance-based promotions. It doesn't just have to be performance-related pay. Non-monetary incentives have not been explored so much as they can be because people are, don't just respond to monetary incentives. There's lots of scope for this. And um, one other thing is that in the name of incentives, we must not, okay, I've got my last one or two sentences to say, and then I will stop. In the name of incentives, what we have ended up doing, you see the justification that was given in the Six Pay Commission, is that in order to attract, I mean, it was not, the Six Pay Commission did not apply only to teachers, it applied to all civil servants, uh, you know, civil service groups. Um, but the justification given was, in the case of teachers and health workers, that uh, it shall attract better quality persons into these occupations. Now, we already have a stock of teachers, a very large stock of teachers. Any new teachers that are attracted into the profession as a result of doubling the teacher pay is going to be a, you know, this is a, we have to distinguish between the stock and the flow concept. Only a small number are going to be flowing in each year. We've got a very large resource being put in in order to bring in that thing. And then it has been put in in a way that flies in the face of, you know, very well-known you know, theories in economics, for example, efficiency wage theory, tells us that, you know, you could double pay, you could quadruple pay, you can make it 10 times, but you, may, you will not elicit any extra effort unless there is a threat of dismissal if the person is found to be um, non-performing. Unless there is a threat of dismissal, you can pay, raise the pay as much as you like uh, if there is no fear of job separation, if I'm found to be chronically absentee, then, uh, then it will not elicit higher effort. So I think that when we make policy, like for teacher incentives, we need to look at the evidence that is there and make better policy. Thank you.